Alice Stewart has just passed away yesterday. She was a great singer-songwriter, and she's been based here in the Pacific Northwest for most of her life, with the last stretch right here in Olympia, Washington. In early 2021, when my son Felix was born, I delegated some interviews I've been scheduling to a handful of trusted guest hosts. Rob Smith is a local guy who produces a podcast called Welcome to Olympia, a show about Olympia history. In remembrance of Alice and her musical legacy, I'm presenting Rob's interview with Alice, originally released back in March of 2021. Lots of love to Alice's family and friends. You're listening to a very special crossover episode between Low Profile and Welcome to Olympia. Welcome to Olympia is a podcast all about Olympia's regional history, hosted by radio journalist Rob Smith. I first met Rob when he asked me for permission to use my band Skrill Meadows' song, Going for Broke, as the outro music for his show. And since then, we've been bouncing ideas off each other, hoping to collaborate one day. In anticipation of the arrival of my new son, Felix, I asked Rob if he would be interested in taking over Low Profile for an episode, interviewing the locally based, acclaimed folk rock musician, Alice Stewart. Here's a clip of the title track from her 1970 album, Full Time Woman. I hear you've got a full time woman now. Does she love you like I never could? Does she try to understand you? Baby, does she love you like I never would? I can feel my inside shaking, dear, I know your heart is breaking now. You gotta set me free. If anybody was up to the task, it was Rob. So he got together with Alice, and she told him her story of growing up in rural Chelan, Washington, getting signed to Arhuli Records, touring the folk festival circuit in the 1960s, her stint accompanying Mississippi John Hurt, her brief relationship with Frank Zappa, facing backlash after going electric, collaborating with Tower for Power, and relocating to the Pacific Northwest after spending some time in New York and California. I'd like to introduce you to Rob, so I'm just going to give him a call right now. Hey, Markley. Hey, Rob. Calling you on a recorded line. All right. We're rolling. <laughs> rolling on one. Man, thank you so much again for recording this interview with Alice Stewart. You got a lot going on with Welcome to Olympia, which is a terrific podcast. It just sounds like you guys had a great conversation. Um, I love the energy between you two. Yeah, it was such a privilege to talk to her. Um, I knew nothing about her before you turned me on to her and suggested this. I kind of fell in love with her. It's incredible stuff. And so I was really excited to talk to her on the phone. Um, She lives here in Olympia, and so I was able to just drive over a recording kit to her house, you know, um, and drop it off because we're obviously doing remote interviews. Oh, wow. And um, I realized that I had plugged the cord into the wrong mic, um, mic port, so oh, you'll, man. you'll hear at the start of the interview that this, um, a little, we're laughing about some technical difficulties, <laughs> uh, but it was great. A really fun interview with her. Cool. Well, um, I think we should just go ahead and let the listeners hear this wonderful conversation, and then uh, we'll check back in at the end of it, okay? Yeah, that sounds great. All right. Thanks, Rob. Well... Alice Stewart, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Oh, yeah, finally, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've had a little technical difficulties. Um, welcome to Low Profile. I'm filling in for Markley. So you've had a, a really long and celebrated career. Uh-huh. And I was hoping we could just kind of go all the way back to the beginning. Sure. Um, you grew up in Chelan, Washington, as I understand. Uh-huh. Nobody Can knows tell- me there. Nobody knows you there. <laughs> no, only my schoolmates. That's it. <laughs> so when I go back, it's really odd. I go, oh, hi. I, I, I used to live here. No, why, oh, no. No, I don't know you. <laughs> I'm like, all right. Can you describe Chelan, like, as you were growing up there? 
As I was growing up, very small town. Luckily, they had a dance studio there, which I was involved in, and they that that was about it. There were no guitars or anything like that. A piano, I played piano, but um, and I played drums. Do you know what brought your family to Shalem? My mother went off to work and left me with my aunt, who who had moved there because her husband had died, and she decided she wanted to raise her kids in a in a um, in a place that wasn't a city, right? Smart for me, right? <laughs> Not a good idea. But <clears throat> anyway, so she got this huge three, four-story house, and and she had a boarding house for a while, and then she started taking in old old people, taking care of them. And in in nineteen fifty. I, she was charging about a hundred dollars a month for these people. Can you believe that? I mean, huh. at this point, it'd be two thousand dollars, twenty five hundred dollars. You know. Anyway, yeah. So she was cooking for them, and then I had to do the cooking sometimes when she was away, which was not very, very seldom. But um, she and I were like um, oil and water. <laughs> um, I think if she'd left me to my own devices, I would have been a pretty good kid. But seeing as how I was, <laughs> she she was very untrustworthy. I mean, she thought I was very untrustworthy, which in a way I was. I was a very overactive kid, you know. So they gave me Librium and, um, oh, what's that other, M M Milltown. They gave me that in grammar school. I don't know what that is. Well... <laughs> It's they're very strong tranquilizers. Wow! So I take those in the morning. I kind of keep me quiet, a little quiet, and then I have to go home and go to sleep because they were just, you know. That's what they did with kids that were overactive. Then you know what I was just probably. I was so miserable at home. I think that I just got out of there and went nuts. You know. Probably. <laughs> she drove me to this business. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I mean, do you think there's any truth to that, though? Do you, do you think you were kind of born to be a musician? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I found out when I was about, hmm, how old was I when I found out about my dad? I was probably 55 or 60 years old. And I finally got my mother to tell me who my dad was. And his name was McNabb. And I researched and I got a hold of my cousins in um, Tulsa. And that's where my music background is. Everybody in the family plays, plays an instrument. In fact, my first cousin is a, uh, had a club. He actually had a club, and he had a p entertainers come in. You know, I said, if I'd known who my dad was, yeah, I was so mad. I, I still, my mother's dead, but I still don't forgive her. I told her I did, but I lied. <laughs> it's a hard and dusty road. It's a hard and heavy load. Some are bad, some are good Some have done the best they could Some have tried to ease my troubling mind And I can't help but wonder where I'm bound Where I'm bound Can't help but wonder where I'm bound What's your first musical memory then? Um... Playing piano when I was about five or six, and then um, in grammar school, then they they let you start playing something. So I played drums, which was not the best choice probably for me. I wish I'd played something like saxophone or something, but I didn't. I played drums. I probably wanted to be louder than everybody else. <laughs> One person in my family who died in Korea, my uncle, was uh, a musician. I think he was a drunk and a musician, but 
because it was <laughs> whatever. Um, but um, yeah, I think he's the only one in the family that really had any musical talent, Hell, except I heard my grandfather played fiddle. He was from Ireland. Did you did y'all listen to the radio? You know, radio over there was not very good because mountains all the way around. So I got I had a shortwave radio in my room that I didn't have any idea how to use, but I sometimes could get coma <clears throat> in Oklahoma. It was a great station. It had like blues music and stuff like that. And uh, I found some, my cousin, I mean, my uncle, Harold, that got killed in the war, had all these records. And he had, and my aunt had them stored in a little place. And he had all these cool records. He had Bessie Smith. He had, he had seven, seven Beers with the Wrong Woman. He, that was on an old record. And uh, that's been recorded by Oodles. After I, you know, did it, a lot of people have done it, my friends. Eventually, you moved to Seattle, is that right? Yeah, as soon as I graduated, the very day. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, why did you want to leave Chelan? There wasn't anything there for me, you know, hanging out, going up and down the strip you know, four times, 40 times, 40, you know, it was stupid. It's just the only time Chelan was any fun was um, in the summer. Summer was really fun. And uh, tourists will come over and boys and, you know, different people. So, <laughs> <laughs> Had you been to Seattle before you? Yeah, you with my with my aunt, we'd go over there for uh, shopping trips because there were <laughs> there was nothing in Chelan. I couldn't wear regular shoes. I couldn't have tennis shoes because my feet were so narrow. So we had to go to Seattle to Nordstrom's to get my shoes. So we. That was one of our trips. We probably took three trips a year over to Seattle. Yeah. So when you left when you left Chelan, um, did you have a car or did you take a bus or? I actually I left Chelan, drove my mother to work in Arizona. I only saw my mother twice twice a year, on my birthday and Christmas. That's it. But this time I was going to go live with her. So I just remembered that. I did that before. Then, and then I left there soon after and, and went to Seattle and started playing music. Can you tell, do you remember arriving in Seattle? Like, what, what were you expecting? What did you find? What... It was wonderful, man. In, in 60, 61, 62, it was great. You know, the avenue. You know, the oh, it was fa fantastic. And this Palmier house was right on the corner of was it 43rd, I think, 43rd and uh, University. And the first couple of times I went by the place, I had a, I had a baritone ukulele at this point. I had it about, about this wide, right? And um, I, I would walk by, and the windows were black, blackened blackened so you couldn't see so I get right up there to the thing and I look and I think oh, I just can't go in there and there would be people in there playing or singing and I finally got up the nerves to go in and so I sat down and then I said could I play something and somebody said oh you play I said yeah a little bit so I, I got up and sang some songs that I had learned from a Burl Eyes songbook and uh the owner gave me a job, you know, three, five dollars. <laughs> it was okay. I mean, I worked every night of the week when I worked there, so it's okay. Twenty-five dollars a week, <laughs> thirty. Who knows? So I, I've heard about like the coffee house scene of the '60s and stuff, but like, what can you kind of paint a picture of what that place looked like when you opened the door and walked in? Yeah, one side of it had had tables and chairs and the front had a few it wasn't real big and the, so the people that were playing were sitting on stools you know like probably room for about three people at once and no microphones you didn't need one you know in there because it's so small so when I first started when I started doing the concerts in the park in Seattle um 
What were those? Oh, King TV or Como? King. I think it was King TV. Anyway, um, I graduated from the Palmier House and all that stuff and went on, you know. But um, by the time we did that, I actually got paid $75 a week for that. <laughs> That's big money. My my house payment was like $75, I think, because I had that, all that money to play with. <laughs> um, yeah, if I'd... If I'd been smart, I would have held on to that house. That would have been a good idea on my part. And, oh, did you did you buy a house there? Uh, my aunt bought me a house, and she said, "So your your payments are like seventy five dollars a month." <laughs> it was a cute little house, you know. What did, what did I need? I had two bedrooms. I had a, a living room and a kitchen, and you know, everything I needed, and a place to park even. So, <laughs> was, it, was that I, right in the U district? Yeah, yeah, but I was in love, and I, I, when he broke up with me, I just went crazy and left. Stupid. I mean, I just left. Wow. What was you guys, how long were y'all dating? Oh, who knows? You know what I mean? Time at that point was pretty weird, probably a couple years, but uh -huh. he was married, and it's all messed up. It's all messed up. Yeah. Yeah. If you're enjoying Low Profile, please help us out by sharing a favorite episode on social media, subscribing, giving us a rating or a review on iTunes, and tell a friend. The illustrations for Season 4 episodes were drawn by Taylor W. Rushing. To find out more about his work and see more of his art, as well as limited edition prints and merchandise, you can visit taylorwrushing.com or find him on Instagram at twrushing. Did you have a, did you have like a group of friends that uh, you hung out with on a regular basis? Or yeah. Were they all mu yeah. were they all musicians? Yeah. Had you recorded any music in Seattle that for, before you left? Um. Yeah, we made a a record in uh, that was my boyfriend and Steve Lawler it was my call, Steve Lawler and me, and we made a a record called uh, Green Satin. On the other side, we had uh, singing "Hallelujah," and and it actually charted on uh, in Seattle. Green satin, amber and pearl, whisper of laughter, silk and curl. Green satin. Lavender chain, pools of clear crystal, her teardrops made. Gone is the flame, cold is the amber, lost is her name. But that's it. That's it, pretty much, for my recording. And then, when I went to um, California, it was, I think it was the winter of '63, so it was, you know, like '64 when I was really got there. But I, um, I tried to get some gigs around, but I didn't talk very much at the time. I wasn't. Um, I was pretty much just totally into my music and not into. You know what I mean? Some people are great entertainers, and other people are just, you know, artists. <laughs> so so I couldn't get jobs down there because you had to be a song and dance man to kind of, you know, get people all riled up. And they, they said my music was good, but they just couldn't deal with me. So um, I got introduced about three months after getting down there. I got introduced to the... Um, director of the uh, Berkeley Folk Festival, 
And I, I knew nothing about the Berkeley Folk Festival. I mean, it was the first festival ever, anywhere. And <clears throat> I sang some songs for him, and he said, well, look, I'm going to, I'm going to, I didn't even know who he was, really, but he said, I'm going to set up some gigs for a couple weeks of gigs, and we'll do these gigs, and who knows, you know. He didn't say anything about the festival, but so I went there, and we did the gigs, and I stayed at their house. Um, and at the end of it, he, he took me out to lunch, and he said, how would you like to be in the festival? And I said, oh, I think I was, well, how old was I, 20? I must have been 22. And after that, then I got recorded on our Huli. That was my first album, and it came out in, in 64, I think. Uh, after the festival. And he didn't usually record people like me that folks, folks, he didn't do folks singers. But he really liked me and and the the person from the festival, Barry, Barry Olivier was his name. And he, um, he I think he talked Chris Strockwitz into recording me. And uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. It's a pretty cool album, actually. I mean, I couldn't listen to it for years, but I can now, and I appreciate it. Um, my voice, Ralph Gleason from the San Francisco Chronicle said my voice was like the like the bleeding of a sheep. You know, he was very bad. I went into his office one time, and I said, I really don't think you need to be that mean. Wow. He said, I didn't need to be mean. I just, he was a he was a sheep. Head is what he was. <laughs> Sounds like it. Do you and I pretty much like... told him that. What? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember, um, like that moment of going on stage? Were you were you nervous? That's a big festival. Oh right my there. God! Yes. Oh, yes. Oh. Tell me about that. Oh man. There were thousands. I mean, people in the Greek theater. <laughs> However many people the Greek theater holds, it was full of people. I was, I mean, the the whole the whole thing. I was petrified. But I hear my voice now from from those things, and I'm just like, wow, you know, how could I have been so stupid? I don't know. I just, I just. What do you mean? I just didn't get it. You know. I'm, I didn't understand that I was really, I really deserved to be there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I've been loving getting to know your music. It's been oh, so fun. Oh, right, right, right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, I I um been listening to it quite a bit. Did I give you the Did I give you that Orhuli recording? Uh, all the, yes. All the good I don't times. know if it's where I'm sitting like this and it's long hair. Do you have any favorites from that from that album? Once I had a sweetheart. Yeah. I had a sweetheart. Now I have none. That one to me. I think it's a great song and I and I, it's it's from from the heart, you know. I had a sweetheart. Now I have none. I think it's the the <laughs> that part of my voice. Oh, it's gone and leave me. God, no. <laughs> Wonder if I should take the train tonight. Maybe at the dawning things will be all right because he loved me. Oh, how he loved me. So much in love. 
I think that album is just, it's pretty original as far as, you know, you know I gotta, gotta say that now, 50, 60 years later, <laughs> almost, yeah. yeah. So you recorded that one in 64, or it was released yeah. in 64? Well, I think it was, yeah, it was recorded and released pretty much the same year, 64, and then I went back east which was a big mistake they should never have done that to me because i'll tell you why because east coast very different from here you know and it, i had to wear dresses in uh in seattle you cannot wear pants to a gig no huh. they would not let you get on the stage really i'm serious wow. so i um uh, I had all my really nice clothes, and I always dressed up, and, and I got to the gig, you know, I had to take a taxi from the hotel. It's like if, if I could have stayed with friends there, I actually would have made some money, you know. But I stayed in hotels, and they thought I was a cop because I was so clean. I didn't know that till years later. This guy that I had met there said, oh, wow, we thought you were a cop. That's why we never invited you over. <laughs> anyway, I was back there long enough to kind of have a panic attack, and yeah. and um, I mean, I did my gigs like I was supposed to, but it was horrible. It was just horrible. You go into so, a you go into a restaurant and and you know you order things to go right, and, you, and you're like in a deli, and it's like what what do you want, lady? And you just kind of go, uh, I don't know. Well, to get back in line, it's just like. Oh my God, he's treating me. It was so bad. I was just such a virgin, you know. Culture shock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so were you you were touring in support of uh, all the good times? Yes. Yeah. But my my agent, who I really didn't know was my agent, Barry Olivier, the director of the festival, had set up all these gigs with Joan Baez's manager back there. He didn't really let me in on stuff like. This is what's going on. It's just like I'm sending you the east, you know. And um, I, uh, he was so disappointed in me. He didn't even pick me up at the airport. He sent somebody else to pick me up when I got back, and I just kind of fell apart, you know. Yeah, he was Why just was like, "That's it for you." Well, <laughs> I don't know. He's a weird guy. I mean, when he's on your team, it's good. But when he's off it, not good. <laughs> and you, you didn't know he was your agent, you said. What? Well, I really didn't. I really didn't. But he was. He was. <laughs> I mean, he could talk to anybody because he could get anybody in his festival. You know, Joan Baez was in the festival when I was there. Oh, I was there in 64, 66, and 68. Oh. And uh, every, everybody hated me in Berkeley, right? Because... I was able to get into all these things, and they couldn't get in at all. And it was just, it, they were jealous, and I didn't know what was going on either. So, yeah, <sighs> crazy mixed wow. up kid. So they were they were jealous of you because you were able to, you were performing at, at, the, at the festival? Yeah, like every other year. <laughs> and so, like, the musicians in and around Berkeley were resentful of you because of that. Exactly, yeah. I see. Yeah. So then you then you made your way back to Seattle, is that right? Uh, you were, no. You were living in oh, Seattle. Oh, no, and... no, 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 no. I stayed there. I stayed in California. I stayed oh. there until 99. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, I was, I was in Berkeley, then I was in Richmond, and I was in... Uh, and then when I got my band together, Snake, um, I moved to Marin County, you know, where all the musicians live, you know. Uh -huh. So, um, so, but, so in your, your next album though, in 1970, was it, um, yeah, Bel was Believing your next one? No, Full Time Woman. Full Time Woman. Ah, oh, I love, yeah, that. <laughs> Yeah. I, I love that album so much. Oh, um, thank you. We've been playing... Um, the second track on that album is I Lose Control. Oh, I love that song. It's a perfect song. I lose 
lose control I watch you play games and roles I guess at first I thought that I could change you You drag me down, put me down Still you keep me hanging on Do you ever notice you might have a need for me? For dishonesty Honey, do you know I'm just a mirror Everything I say is wrong And everything I felt For you was gone It wouldn't really matter It was recorded by um, Jimmy Rabbit. Have you ever heard of Jimmy Rabbit? He made uh, an album produced by Waylon Jennings, and he put that song on there. Oh, I don't know wow. if it ever sold anything, but... <laughs> so, you, have, I mean, have you always written music? When was... You know, I really have, but I, I just didn't have the... You know, when I was playing folk music at first, I just didn't think about doing anything I'd written. Such a great voice. Thank you. Yeah. It's lowered a lot. It's lowered a lot since, um, you know, you start... Some people can sing. I suppose if you don't stop singing, if you don't smoke any cigarettes or anything, <laughs> or drink or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you um, about... I understand you toured with Mississippi John Hurt. Yeah, not very much, just a little bit. He, uh, yeah. I did some gigs with him in L.A., and and then uh, we did that Berkeley Folk Festival. And at the Ash Grove in Los Angeles, um, Santa Monica, is that where it is? I can't remember. But anyway, L.A. is just L.A. to me. Um, we played at the Ash Grove. He, I just drove him there, and I happened to have my auto harp with me. I don't know why, but um, he said... Oh, I'm not going on without her. And I said, me? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, no, 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 no. No, this is your show. He goes, no, not going on. No kidding. And I said, well, all right. So I took my auto harp up there and played with him. It was just amazing the whole night. And do you think anybody was into video back then? Damn, that would have been a show, man. I, I was just like, I was 22 years old going, oh, my God, these people are going to think I'm not, you know. But if I'd been smart, like Bonnie was, well, of course, she had money, for one thing. She had money, and I didn't. But, you know, then she went and she visited this person and that person and this person. I just made friendships with people that I got along with, you know what I mean? He and I were different generations different colors different but we just we had a unity that was just beautiful and i was lucky to know him he uh, he died two two years later right yeah. i was gonna say i mean he as i understand he was sort of um touring kind of late in his life right exactly yeah yeah yeah, he was just playing for the fun of it, you know, and then somebody discovered him and said, well, I'll get you, get you, he only will have a guitar, I bought him a guitar, and yeah, he was a, just a great guy. I had him, he stayed at my house for uh, a week or two weeks, something like that, and luckily I had a spare room, and he, um, he didn't talk much, he just, you know what I mean? We just, yeah. it, it wasn't that he was shy or anything. Well, maybe he was a little shy, but it was just that we just seemed to, you know, was okay. We were okay. 
Obviously, or he wouldn't ask me to come up there and play with him. (laughs) Do you think you picked up any of uh, your style from him? Well, he was very heavy on the thumb. He was boom, bang, boom, bang. You know, and I don't Uh think I, no, I don't think so. I don't think I, mm -mm. because I never really copied anybody. You know, I I took what they had and just did it my way. That's why I have a problem playing in bands where you're doing other people's tunes. Because basically I do my own tunes and, and I'm fine, I'm comfortable with it. But if I have to get into somebody else's thing, it depends on who it is. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? If they are more on my wavelength, I can fit in with it a little better. But I don't, pretty much I'm not that good at that. I mean, probably. I hate saying that, but don't, <laughs> don't, don't repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wanted to ask you about, um, I read that you were part of the first like multi-day festival here in Washington. Right. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, Sky River Rock Fest uh, and, and and blah blah blah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. It was incredible. I mean, I when I was in the first one, I had been camping outside Baker, Oregon, with um, Wayne and my baby, and we're camping out there, right? Just like, uh, and I wrote a song there. And then I went to the, I got, I borrowed a guitar. I don't know where my guitar was, but I borrowed this great guitar and I went to uh, the festival and I played there and it was muddy, it was raining and it was in Monroe. It was wonderful for everybody. They just had a great time. They didn't care. You know, people that live up here know that it rains. That's all there's to it. So, yeah. So so from there, after that, because I just kind of left, left him. I left Wayne at that point and went to Canada because I had a gig up there. I asked you just the other day, is there something I can do or say to make it better together? But you just smiled and said, it doesn't matter, not anymore. What did touring look like? You know, nowadays a big act has a big bus and, you know, a trailer and all that. What was touring like for you in those days? You know, it was really cool. I was in a festival in uh, Utah. Utah or... Judy Collins was the main the main act. I think it was me, Judy Collins, um, that crazy guy that I told you is nuts, uh, Jack, Jack uh, Elliott. And um, probably a couple more, I can't even remember. But it was some kind of a festival. And that my boyfriend from Seattle showed up there. So the that, that got me all with you. It got me all back into him. And so anyway, they took us down uh, they took all of us on a on a boating trip down um, uh, 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 not the Snake River, but the uh, one of a uh, big big river thing that I could usually remember the name of, now no, I can't. But it was a great trip. I loved it, and Mike was there with me. So so I kind of went back. I had gotten married. Just stupid. I had married this guy, who's now a millionaire, by the way. You would never have known it, because he was just not right for me. But anyway, I went back, to, after being with Mike for a week, I went back and I said, I'm leaving. <laughs> Just crazy. So uh, we weren't married very long. 
uh, year maybe. And I was in Berkeley part of the time and doing other stuff. Yeah, nice guy. And though. you, <laughs> he's a millionaire now. <laughs> Did I mention that? <laughs> So let's see. In 1970, you had Full Time Woman that came out, mm -hmm. and in in 72, you released um, Believing. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. And that was with Snake. Yes. Was that a a band that you pulled together, or were you kind of? Well, it was my band, but and and I got it got it together. When I was with Fantasy, after I made the record, then I had to get a band together. And um, uh, so I had this band, and it had four, this is, it was drums, bass, keyboard, and another guitar player. So there were really five of us, but two of them dropped out. The guitar player was a um, hard drug uh, user, and he had to go. And uh, the keyboard player just didn't like the music or something. So uh -huh. uh, that just left me with the bass player and the drummer. And we played so well together. I have a lot of tapes of, in fact, I just found a CD. I didn't know I had it, of, of playing the Rainbow in, in England. Um, Rainbow Theater was an incredible, incredible place. Real fire trap, but beautiful. I mean, it, it was... <sighs> You know, if you think about an old um, old theaters where where maybe they had vaudeville and stuff, it was like wood and it was big. And it, I climbed all the way to the top, like in the stair. It was just very cool. I loved it, and we sound so good. I mean, I'm not kidding. For three people in a band, it sounded pretty good to me. But we would have been a lot better with a keyboard player. It seems like your your style has started to evolve at this point too yeah i the track that's really st stood out to me was uh karma stands in my way yeah oh man that gave me goosebumps as soon as those horns came in just oh a tower of power <laughs> those are tower of power horns my need to touch you is getting stronger every day my need Constantly in my way, you know the word I want to hear, and how much I need you to stay. But come stand in my way. We were all buddies yep and it took them that long i i sang to them the part i wanted there I'm like um da 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 they just played it and that was perfect it was you know it was just you're professional you're a professional walk out with your 300 dollars, walk out the door you you know it's great perfect You spent some time in Austin, Texas, it sounds like. I did. I did. Yeah, this is another time I kind of panicked. Um, it was a time when I promised my son either I will have made it by that point or I just forget it and we go somewhere. So I I had a house in Marin, right? Sublet my house. So were you, were you doing music in Austin or were you... Um... I was trying not to. <laughs> I, w I got a real job as a cashier at a uh, record, at a audio component store, really. But I had a lot of records in there, too. So, you know, Texas had the lowest rate of pay. Oh, my God. I mean, I had, a, I had my car I had to pay on every month, 
and I made just enough for that. That's it. I I didn't have money money for anything, but I had a job and I did my job and I had to also had the charge of the plants and stuff they had in there. I took care of that. And um, Diane from Houston came in one time who was. Um, he was a, a record distributor guy. He would come in with a bunch of records and, you know, we do our thing. And he said, I know you. You're Alice Stewart. And I said, yeah. And he said, he said, uh, you know what? I got John Prine coming into Houston and I need a, a, a act to open for him. And so I agreed to do that, which was pretty great. That was fabulous. I wish, I wish John had remembered me for that because we had the best time. I mean, we, we got together about probably two or three in the afternoon, went to the guy's club. He was in this, you know, major club and he got us in there and we drank free, free for like three hours. Terrible. I mean, and by the time we got to the, the gig, probably at 6, he must have eaten something, too. I have no idea. But anyway, we got there, and I did a set, he did a set, and then we did a set together. And it was just like we'd known each other forever. It was wow. incredible. I, I loved that. I would get would have been nice if I could have fit into that. See, and I probably could have if I'd used my uh, ways that I didn't have then. <laughs> you got it. You got to know how to brown those people, man. I just didn't have it. <laughs> no. Nope. You said you wish John remembered you. Well, how yeah. Do you mean by that? One time I went up to him uh, many years later. I went up to him uh, at a concert that we were both in the thing, and I went up to him. And I said, "Hey, John," and he was like. He's kind of like he's afraid of me or something. He got real weird in his later years. He didn't uh. want to... This wasn't really later, though. It wasn't even mm. later years. This was more like 1990 or something like that. I don't know. I can't remember. I gather you've probably been interviewed quite a few times oh, over yeah. the years. Yeah. And I just wonder if there's... On my notes, I have uh, Frank Zappa... I wanted to ask you about Frank Zappa. I just wonder if, like, do you get tired of answering the same questions all the time about... <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes so um, it can turn into a fun thing. Like, this is more oh. fun than usual. Okay, cool. That's good to know. So you met Frank Zappa, though, um, trying to meet somebody else. Can you tell me that story? That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we were both there to meet Steve Mann, who's a guitar player. We were both there to meet him, and he never showed up. But Frank was there. I was there. We were the only people, person, people in this coffee shop. And we got to talking, and I said, oh, yeah, I'm here to meet somebody. He said, yeah, me too. He says, who are you eating? Are you? Steve, man. No kidding, me too. So we just wound up being together for a while, a couple of months, I think, something like that. Yeah, you know, he wasn't... He wasn't anything like he turned out to be when I was with him. He he was very, you know, beaming on something, and I didn't know, not drugs ever. He didn't do anything but smoke cigarettes. That was it. You know, no alcohol, no... Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he just... We had a blues band, and I told him I wanted to play electric guitar, because I had acoustic guitar. And she says, no, I want you to play that acoustic. And I said, I don't want to play the acoustic. I'm tired of playing the acoustic. So he got me an electric guitar. This is very funny. It was about this this long, and the strings were about that far above the... No, it was really... He knew I wouldn't be able to play it. It was he, tiny. He knew it. He says, well, you, you can't play that. You, you can't play an electric guitar. And I'm like... Yeah, well, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, so, I bought my first electric guitar after that. I bought, I traded in, damn it, and I've never seen another one, a Stuart banjo, and it was spelled the way I spell my name, was a Stuart banjo, and it was um, 
Well, it was just priceless, and I sold it to buy my Telecaster. Oh, that, and I got paid for a year's worth of guitar lessons from this friend of mine. So I got I got $120, plus that $40, and bought my first Telecaster. <laughs> wow. I, I read somewhere that there are people that um, were resentful that you went electric. Oh, yeah. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so, why I got my hair done. That's why I got my hair all frizzed up, because I said, okay, if I'm going to change my music, kind of. I mean, I still did the same songs. I just did them on electric, you know, really. Yeah. And I had a drummer and a bass player. They got used to it. So they just said, time marches on, you know. People do things, and, yeah, they still showed up, so that was good. But we played different venues after that, you know. The the Freight and Salvage was the only place that we that we played regularly that I'd always played. Uh -huh. But then then we played in electric places like Mandrakes and the Corroboree and um, oh the um, oh, what was the name of that place in Oakland where I got my guitar stolen? I really ought to remember that one shoot well anyway it was a big place big place and uh, my my roadie had locked the um, well he had put everything in the car and the truck that we were driving and i was inside the club and three guys came and opened the door and took my guitar and oh. and one speaker and that dr the drummer was like well, that's my speaker. I want to get paid for that. And I said, well, what about my guitar? And it's like, what an asshole. It was bad. Yeah. Uh. He was my boyfriend for a while, which was what ultimately broke the band up, unfortunately. This was Snake. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so when, when and why did you move back up to the Northwest? Because my my... My career just kind of took off again up here. It was like, wow, Alice Stewart, we haven't seen her for years. And then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and I just decided that it was time for me to come home. Yeah. You know, the California is it's, it's a weird place to try and get a foothold in anything. You know what I mean? Because you've got a lot of guys that, mostly guys, that have been around for years. They've lived there for years. They never left. And they kind of think they own the place, kind of. And you can't get into the really good places because you've kind of lost your your um, audience. And uh -huh. so it's like, what's the point of playing these little crummy places where you don't make any money? Anyway, my my thing up here started getting better because... People were coming to the gigs. I was getting different band members. I, I'm just cha changing, changing, changing until finally I found Mark Willett, my bass player. And through that, I got Rick Boyce, my my drummer, and then Steve, Steve um, Flynn, my my keyboard player. Yeah. And and it finally stuff started clicking. You know, they started falling into place. And uh, unfortunately, it's kind of like when I take a tune to them and they would go, "Oh, you do this with your other band? Yeah, if I'd like to do it that way." And they go, mm, "No." <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all as musicians. We all have these funny little, like the drummer would say. Okay, he would have his drum machine so that he could he could tap the time so he knew exactly how he had all totally organized right so i'd say let's do this a little faster tonight mm -mm. <laughs> he didn't want it oh he wouldn't he would not uh. do it any faster he went this is where we do the tune <laughs> it, it was it's funny when you think about it and then the bass player who's like well i'll come up with my own part and then it always sounds different right which is uh -huh. Not that it's bad, it's just that you want it to sound like it used to. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. live and learn. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a um, an album at the Triple Door, that live at the Triple Door in 2005. Yes. 
that was a great album and it just sounded like there was a, a room full of people that were so eager to hear you yeah yeah it was and packed house it was it was good yeah I ain't pretty but I got some style I ain't young no more no but I can still be wild been so many places I've done so many things now it's time to grab that golden ring. I got something that I know is true. I got something for you. I got something. 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 I, I used to play there about once a year, and I I noticed they stopped calling. Somebody would have just told them I got too old to play or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure I could get another job if I called them. I just, you know, haven't been into playing that much uh-huh. lately. What's next for you? Like, what? That's a good question. I've been asked if I was going to make another record or, you know, maybe a solo thing, something. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. I'm kind of writing a song about my mother right now. It's, it's a song that basically tells a story of why I wasn't with my mother. And, mm-hmm. our, and, and, um, and you know, she never, she just couldn't, didn't get it. She just, she, my aunt, my, my mother, both of them, just did not get what I was doing or why. I just... They came to a show later on, and when I came back up here in 99, probably. So they came, my cousin brought them to a show. And my aunt was just like, oh, it's so loud, I can't stand it, I can't stand it. And my mother was just bored. And there's a great show, it was in a great auditorium. And we had a bunch of people who didn't know each other, and we all just got together. And you know what I mean? It was just really cool. And Mike, Mike, my cousin, said, "Don't ever ask me to do that again, ever, ever." That was the most miserable because of them, because they were just so, oh. such a pain in the butt, you know. Uh, just shows you showed up in the wrong family. <laughs> <laughs> I did. If I'd thrown up in the right family, uh, I would be rich. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy. You know, when yeah. I got three kids, I love them, and grandkids love them, and they're just all good people. And mm-hmm. I don't know what I had to do with that, but if I had anything to do with it. And then none of them are in the music business. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess yeah. I taught them something. <laughs> Uh, well thank you so much Alice you're welcome thank you really really appreciate it All right. wow Rob so many good stories (laughs) there (laughs) Um, I I can't thank you enough for making that happen and thanks to Alice as well yeah thank you and uh, yeah seriously thank you Alice Um, I really enjoyed that and I don't think she'd mind us saying that so Alice is 78 years old now right yeah there was um, <laughs> it's funny there, during the interview um, it didn't make the cut but there were several instances where she kind of stopped and said yep it, it's been a long strange trip <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, I don't know I just I like her um, I like her attitude yeah she's definitely got attitude <laughs> can't argue with that I've met her now, and like I feel like I'm gonna run into her at the grocery store sometime, and be like, "Hey, Alice, how you doing? I know you." And maybe she'll remember me. But, um, yeah, it was it was just really an honor. This is a good point in the conversation just to mention that if our listeners have enjoyed Rob's craft, you can hear more of it. Uh, his podcast is called Welcome to Olympia. You can get it wherever you get podcasts or welcome to Olympia.com. And you're yeah, also doing uh, audio documentaries for hire. Yeah, that's right. I, um, 
I run a service called Keepsake Audio, and it's um, audio biographies on commission, uh, usually of people's uh, older loved ones. And it, it's like an hour-long audio biography, audio documentary about someone's life. Um, and that's been, been a cool thing to do, too. That's brilliant. And I just want to say, um, your podcast, Markley, Low Profile, has been awesome um, to listen to over the years now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> We've been... You have dozens of episodes at this point. Yeah, I think this is episode 37, yeah. I think. Um, I just, I love how deep your conversations go with the guests. Um, how much, how much you learn about somebody. And, and almost all of your guests I've never heard of. And, and almost all of them by the end, I'm like, oh, I love this stuff. I love this music. <laughs> Uh, so that's been a real treat. Curiosity about all these people just sort of drove me to want to find out more. I love it. Yeah. I think I, think I have a little bit of that in common with you. <laughs> Absolutely. Rob, thank you so much, and I uh, hope we can do something like this again. I'd love that. It's yeah. been great thank crossing you, over. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Well, you have a lovely day. You too, Mark. See ya. See ya.